Music is at the heart of most of our religious traditions, and in many places of worship, the most popular forms of music are being used. In the Chicago suburb of South Holland, Ozzy Smith Jr. is pastor of Covenant United Church of Christ. He's also a professional jazz musician, and that music makes its way into his services. Before we meet Ozzy here in the studio, let's watch him at work. Reverend Ozzy E. Smith Jr., Senior Pastor of Covenant United Church of Christ, South Holland. My grandfather, Albert Campbell, my maternal grandfather in Memphis, he was uh, an ordained deacon at, at the church and the first deacon I ever knew. Uh, and I went to church with him all the time because I just liked being around him. My grandfather made everybody feel special around him and he just, uh, when I'm thinking about him now, I get, I get full. Uh, he, was, um, he was shot in the leg at, at a hospital, Methodist Hospital in Memphis. Um, back in the, in, in, in the 30s, 30s somewhere in there, 30s or 40s, because he didn't serve coffee fast enough, a, uh, a white gentleman shot him in the, in the knee, but he, and the bullet stayed in there, so he walked with a limp. And I wanted to be so much like him, I limped as he walked, just so I could be like him. My mother was a member of Capitol and Columbia Record Clubs, and so she had a hi-fi record player. And she played Ray Charles, Ivory Joe Hunter, Dakota Stadden, Wes Montgomery, Benny Goodman, so I was about 10 or 11 then, and I asked my father for a saxophone, and my father said no. And while the family was gathering in the living room of the house, I walked in the middle of the family and said, will y'all help my daddy buy me a saxophone? <laughs> I got a horn that Christmas. It was a used Yvette and Schaefer. The saxophone saved my life socially and everything in high school, because I was pretty much a nerd, wallflower, um, didn't, didn't, didn't do the parties. I stayed in the band room. The saxophone was an outlet for me when I found out that not only did I like it, I could play it and I, I just ate it up. And it just opened so many doors for me. I married a church musician. My, my, my wife was the minister of music at Olivet Baptist Church in Memphis, the late Barbara Westbrook Smith. She just passed away almost three years ago. And she introduced me to Christ in a way that I had not ever met Christ. And so the pastor, uh, Reverend Kenneth T. Whalem Sr., who is Kirk Whalem's father, jazz musician, uh, said, you're going to be the interim minister of music for a year. I said, what? I got ordained in 1994 and got called to plant this church in 95. This is the main sanctuary of Covenant United Church of Christ, um, 19,500 square feet. By the last week in August, uh, we should be in here. Presently, we are worshiping now at Thorn Ridge High School, where we've been now for the past five months. I believe God is peeling this onion back even farther. Whenever one gets involved with God, it does not yet appear what one will be. And, and God is always saying, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? Mm-hmm. 
Well, teacher, scholar, theologian, professor, pastor, and musician, Ozzie Smith Jr., thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. We want to spend time talking about, I think, this interesting connection between your music and your ministry. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in the previous segment, but help us understand um, when that calling happened for you. You were, I believe, a professional musician at the time, doing some other things, and yes. then something moved in you, and you said, I got to do more than this. So. I, I, I taught school in the day, played the clubs at night uh, at Olivet Baptist Church in Memphis and uh, that I married into where my wife was minister of music. Mm -hmm. That's where it happened because her pastor, the pastor then, late Kenneth T. Whalem, hired me as the church saxophonist. Uh, and so I played in the services. I could not stand gospel music. This is the, this is the other thing. <laughs> Couldn't stand gospel music and I married a gospel musician uh, who was a banker by profession. And so playing it, I found out that uh, what, how I played in another arena, another venue, in the, ja in the jazz clubs and R&B and that kind of stuff, another kind of audience, but took another kind of player to play in church. I remember the first time I played Peace Be Still by the late James Cleveland in church at my wife's church, an old lady came up after I finished playing. She said, son, I heard a lot of learning in that playing. She said, but I didn't hear any burning in that playing. <laughs> I said, oh, and I immediately understood what she was saying. The learning is one thing. That's, the, that's where you learn the, the, the techniques, the etudes, the scales, and all of that, all of that. But that does not touch the soul. And that's what she was talking about, the burning, because the burning reaches beyond the instrument. It, reaches, it takes the technique and allows the technique to do other things. And so it speaks uh, from your heart. And so I, I was taken back by her comment, but then I... Uh, it was my goal to, to get that. My wife had it when she would sing at the, when we were eating breakfast and bring me to tears. Uh, and, and so that, that, that was the difference. Did you feel that before being a church musician, when you'd played in the clubs and jazz, that you had the burning there and you were afraid to bring it into the church? Or? No, I always had church in my life. I've uh -huh. uh, been going to church since I was in diapers, but that's, that's the thing, I was going to church. Huh. When I met my wife, she got me in church. Something, there's a difference. I noticed something about her. You know, we, we date and we do all this in life. And, and I noticed something about her. She had that burning that that old lady was talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and, she, and the way she spoke, the way she sang, the way she did it. Uh, and I said, I don't have it. And I found out you can't fake it. You either have it or you don't. And so I said, I want that. You know, I, I want that. What about the, the improvis improvisational nature of jazz in and of itself? I, I know a friend I saw speaking about this, Otis Moss III recently, yes. loves jazz, and yes. I know you know him well, yes, I'm yes, sure. Yes. So uh, talk a little bit about the connection of the improvisational nature of, of the music that you do and how you connect that to ministry, because I imagine as UCC pastors, you've got to prepare yeah. a sermon. Oh, yes. It's got to be organized in somehow, but oh, yes. it might be an interesting process here we could hear about. The improvisational part of it is exactly what that, what that lady was talking about. The, a, hymn can, a hymn is a launching pad. And so I was, uh, in playing uh, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow, I was just modulating upwards because that's God leading you and God continuing to lead you. And after a while, you leave the melody and you improvise on what the Spirit has caused to happen in you. Uh, the late John Coltrane, of course, when he, when he recorded uh, uh, Love Supreme, uh, his major work, was when he crossed over and talked about God in the liner notes, making a few jazz musicians a little angry. But, but if you would hear the first number he plays on the acknowledgement, now it's rather abstract when you listen to it because it's atonal and you don't know what, what he's doing, but that was his step into uh, the realm of God and of faith and mm -hmm. improvisational totally, but, but, but atonally. But, and so the imp improv peace happens as the spirit gives utterance to what I'm playing. So, so a lot of people, I think, when they see a preacher get up there without notes and they think, oh, that person's improvising, or they see a musician, um, and they make it look easy. Uh, but what a musician will tell you is improvisation takes an enormous amount of practice and preparation to be able to do that. You've got to know the melody. You know, the, the, the melody is written down, or we call on the jazz musician, we call it the lead sheet. Yeah. And so that establishes the chord progressions and everything like that. And so everything that, imp that you do afterwards, the improvisation, is based on the melody. So as a preacher, what's the melody? The melody is that thing in the, in the text uh -huh. that the late Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor and Dr. Jeremiah Wright always told me that will leap out and say, preach me. When you're reading a text, the lectionary gives you the text, of course, you know, I preach lectionary, but there is something in that text that says, preach me. Uh -huh. And so that, that becomes the melody. 
and everything thereafter because I'm a manuscript preacher. And so uh, all of the points, all of the issues, and, and, and also keeping in mind where the congregation is. After I exegete a, a text, I need to have exegeted the congregation. And a pastor that does not exegete his or her congregation does not know who he or she is preaching to. And I think Fred Craddock said it best, you're hurling words at strangers when you don't know who you're talking mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. So as you gave me an opening before when you said jazz musicians were upset about God being mentioned in liner notes. And I want to ask you as a professional musician who probably knows a lot of other professional musicians, what's that spiritual faith walk like? Okay, I, I've come from an uh, entertainment background and I found in my experience that many people just didn't have that as a priority in their life, weren't bad people, just weren't interested in organized religion per se, didn't find the value in it. I'm right. sure you could Mm -hmm. Give us some interesting insights. Well, well, well the, the thing is, uh, the, the church and the club were seen as two different places. That's secular, this is sacred. Right, right. Well, well, the African mindset, all is sacred. And so when jazz musicians got bit by the bug of faith mm -hmm. or wanted to cross over, when Coltrane wanted to cross over, when Duke Ellington wanted to cross over and, and, and wrote sacred concerts, he was hassled too when he wrote Come Sunday. He said, why would you write that? You know, you, yeah. you've been writing uh, Take the A Train. You've been writing uh, Sophisticated Ladies. You've been writing all this, this stuff out here. He said, well, uh, to his critics, when they said, how do you respond to your critics? He said, well, somebody has to have a job. <laughs> he said, mine is to write music. Right. And so, you know, you, you cross over. It's all out there. And, and when God begins to speak, it, it, it gets into your music. So you're, you're a very well-known preacher and pastor. Do you feel that you chose that over the music, or do you feel that perhaps you didn't have to choose? I feel like I didn't have to choose because I, I accepted the calling at the age of 40. And, and anybody that would accept the call to minister at the age of 40 has to be out of their mind. <laughs> <laughs> because I left everything to come to Chicago. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, when Dr. Wright, Dr. Jeremiah Wright said, look, you come to Chicago, we'll send you to seminary. Wow. And so I didn't understand at the moment what was happening. But like Abraham had to leave Haran, I had to leave Memphis. And, and come up here and go to seminary. And so all of that stuff got mixed in the rue. Theological education was the rue. And then what has happened since that is the, is the gumbo. <laughs> So wonderful. Well, that's fantastic. Ozzy, we're so glad you've been with us today and you're doing great work at your new church building and we wish you all the very best in that moving forward and keep inspiring us with the music, okay? Thank you. All right.